All right, Nicholas Copernicus, one of the four scientists we're going to be learning about of the scientific revolution. Copernicus from Poland um, is the one who is famous for the heliocentric theory. Okay? Heliocentric, you break that down, the ancient Greek. Would it be helio means sun, centric means centered. So the sun-centered theory. This states that all planets in the solar system orbit around the sun versus the previous way of thinking that everything revolved around the earth. Okay, so heliocentric theory, Nicholas Copernicus. Um, this is going to be the exact opposite of what Ptolemy would have stated. Now, Ptolemy was an ancient Greek thinker um, who did some astronomy, looked up at the stars, and he came to the revelation and a belief that everything in the universe revolves around earth, that earth is the center of the universe. This is where we're at as humans. Everything revolves around us, okay? Uh, Copernicus is going to come around and say, no, wait a minute, that's not right. We're going to mix this up a little bit different. Okay, so if you look off on the right side of your screen, you see Ptolemy's view of what happens. We've got the Earth sitting there in the middle of the solar system. Um, everything else is revolving around the Earth. You can see how it looks like it's going just like that. Okay, that is Ptolemy's system, the geocentric theory. If we look on the left, we see Copernicus' idea of what happens within the universe. Okay, we've got the sun in the middle, and everything is going to revolve around the sun in these perfect circles going through right like that. Okay, so Copernicus, heliocentric theory, sun-centered model that you can see off on the left. Next, this is going to bring us to Mr. Kepler. Okay, Kepler is going to take the heliocentric theory and he's going to build onto that. Okay, all these four scientists really go in order for a reason. They build upon one another. You could not have Kepler's work without the work of Copernicus. Okay, so Kepler is going to expand upon the heliocentric theory. And his belief is that objects are going to move faster the closer they are to the sun. So the sun, um, he's not going to really explain what this is necessarily, but there's going to be some force that's going to make objects move faster the closer they are to the sun. So if you look at this graph and this little chart right in front of you, Okay, you can see where the sun's labeled, and the planet, as it's closer to the sun, moves that distance in one month compared to the planet farther from the sun, moves a shorter distance in the same amount of time. So Kepler believes that you're going to move faster the closer you are to the sun. You can see this uh, diff right here, exactly how this is going. Okay, the planets go, the closer they get to the sun, which is a big red plus sign in the middle, they're going to move faster the farther they get away, the slower they are going to be moving. Additionally, he is going to believe that the orbit of the planets is going to be a elliptical. Um, so we have Copernicus who believed the planets orbited in a perfect circle. Kepler is going to say, no, not quite. They're going to be elliptical or egg-shaped. And it's going to look just like this. Okay, they're going to get closer to the sun. They're going to move faster. The farther they're from the sun, the slower they're going to be moving. Okay, so it looks just like this. Egg-shaped, elliptical versus the perfect circles that we see with Mr. Copernicus. Galileo. Galileo is going to be important because he is the one who says that stars are made of matter. Stars are not um, just some orb of light going up in the solar system, up in the sky at night. Uh, stars are made of similar stuff that Earth is made of. Just like Earth is made of something, okay, matter is simply something, a material, uh, something, substance. Uh, the stars are made of something just like Earth. Additionally, Galileo is going to develop the theory of motion. This is going to be important. We're going to explain this one, a couple graphs, and explain to you what exactly is Galileo's theory of motion. Um, the important thing to understand about Galileo's theory of motion is it differs from Aristotle. Aristotle, the Greek philosopher and scientist, um, who believed that an object is going to naturally be at rest until something goes and pushes against it, causing an object to start moving. Okay. Now, um, Galileo is going to really differ that. So we look right here. The cannonball being shot up. Okay, under Galileo's theory, it goes up and is going to continue to go up until it, okay, because there's something projecting it in that way. But a natural state is that it's going to stop moving. Naturally, it's going to quit moving because that's just the way it is. Galileo is going to say something different, that an object is going to be is naturally in motion um, and is only going to come to rest when there is something causing it to rest. Okay, so things are going to naturally either be like naturally be moving until something comes and causes them to not move. So you see the diagram right here and we'll explain this a little bit more in person to make sure you can understand what's going on. Okay, Aristotle is it will go up until it no longer is being projectiled and then it will simply fall back down. Um, Galileo is going to say that the moment you fire that cannon ball is going to kind of stop going up and start going down and slow down simply because there is something that is stopping that, namely friction from the air causing this cannonball to stop moving. Now, finally, we're going to talk about Isaac Newton, the man with gravity, okay? Uh, his book is going to be called Principia, which is going to be important, okay? The principles of what you really need. 
and why stuff works in physics. He is going to come up with the idea of inertia, which is simply stating that a force is needed if something is going to move. Um, so anything you have, K, is just going to simply, an object in rest will stay in rest until something goes and forces that to move. There's different laws that we're going to be talking about. Uh, he also states that force equals mass times acceleration. Um, so the amount of force existed upon something which is needed to move something is going to be the mass of the object giving that force plus the acceleration. So how fast is it moving? Um, it's going to talk about equal and opposite reactions. So every time you do something, um, you're going to have an equal and opposite reaction. So for example, right now I am pushing down on my desk. At the same time I'm pushing down on my desk, uh, my desk is also pushing back at me. It's the equal amount and the opposite. Once the equal and opposite is broken, we are going to have inertia. Something is going to start to move. Okay, so for example, my coffee mug that is sitting on my desk, um, when my force or my force is larger, I can pick up my coffee mug. Otherwise, the equal and opposite reaction is going to keep it in place. Additionally, he comes up with the idea of gravity, which is this force that allows things to orbit. Um, so what things that are, it's the system that allows the planets to keep moving. It's the reason they move faster when they're closer to the sun and farther or slower the farther they are from the sun. That is going to be the four uh, scientists are going to be talking about. Comment down below for any questions. Otherwise, have a great day.